Hello, and welcome to a little thing that I'm calling Hall of History. I started a little true crime thing back in the spring, which I'm still working on, but I also wanted to start something with history. And just like the true crime thing, this is no fuss, no muss, no frills, no editing, nothing like that. Literally just keep on going. That's why most of the people I have on here are actors, because we know how to screw up and just keep going. Um, and the first thing I wanted to talk about on this was um, an event that was based on a musical that I was really, really into. And I got into in college because they performed it in my college. And I invited my friend Adam, who was my first guest on my crime podcast about that. It's not a podcast. It's a chit chat. I don't know what it is yet, but about dying down. So now I had asked you before we before we agreed to do this, if you had issues with certain things and phobias, because there, this is very, um, it can be very triggering. <laughs> if you have certain phobias, nothing too serious, but like I know some people who are, let's just say claustrophobic, when we see some of the images and describe some of the things, it may be a little scary. So you said you were okay with that for the most part. Well, we'll find out. I, I am claustrophobic. Okay. Uh, but I, I mean, if I pass out, just go on without me. It's okay. okay. All, right. All right. So this is actually, and I didn't learn this until, let me cite my sources, like a good little reporter. Um, I didn't know this until I saw an interview with the men who wrote Trapped, uh, the story of Floyd Collins, uh, Robert K. Murray, and Roger W. Bruckner. This is the revised edition. And then there's also an amazing article that, full disclosure, I'm pretty much kind of using as my guide from Mental Floss by Lucas Riley, written on July 13th, 9, uh, 2018, called The 1925 Cave Rescue That Captivated a Nation. I'll link all of that down below. Um, and the reason that kind of I thought I wanted to talk about this, in addition to be a musical, that I really enjoy with a book, and it was originally directed by Tina Landau, who did the SpongeBob musical. I'm sure she's done other stuff, but I believe that's her most recent project. And with beautiful music by Adam Gutel, who did Light at the Piazza, the last song in this show is one of the most beautifully haunting things that I've ever seen on stage or heard. But this was the third biggest news event. I'm not sure internationally, but I know at least in the US, between World War I and World War II. The first being the Lindbergh flight, <laughs> the second being the Lindbergh kidnapping. So that's kind of how big this event was. And not a lot of people know about it now. I think if you don't specifically have a certain kind of hobby, like caving, or if you don't live in that area where it happened, lots of people don't know. So we are gonna start by trying to do my first screen share because Let's see how that goes. Very excited. Uh, oh, I'm so glad. I know you could have seen Diane's car. <laughs> yeah, good old Diane. Good old. And it's it. Uh, my my personal knowledge of this subject, I know nothing about it. You I know the, the, yeah, the, I was the, like, you know it's a little bit about caving and stuff. I, I know it's about a guy who gets stuck. That's all I know because <laughs> I've seen Ace in a hole. Uh, 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 um, uh, Ace in the hole, which was yes. Ace. And that was actually what was um, partially based on this. An interesting um, fact that I found was that for a long time, Billy Bob Thornton had the rights to this story. Mm -hmm. He doesn't anymore, sadly. But we're going to start with, this is our man. Not exactly sure, but this is Floyd Collins. Hi, Floyd. Hi, Floyd. He was born um, July 20th, 1887 in Kentucky. And he and his, and this is a lovely picture of his house where he grew up with, I believe, five brothers and two sisters. I think his dad was married like three times. Um, okay. And Floyd grew up just four miles. That house was four miles from Mammoth Cave, which would later become Mammoth Cave National Park. And it has beautiful caves that are bigger than most mansions. Mm -hmm. And you can own these caves at these times as well. You would have hold a lease to a cave because it wasn't a national park yet. And Floyd always dreamed of finding a cave of his own. Don't we all? Don't we all want our it's, own? It's the American dream. Yep. And I should say, I'm not sure if I did, but this is pretty much takes place in Kentucky, specific, specifically Cave City. 
Um, he do. began exploring these caves alone when he was just six years old, which is, you know, now we worry about kids going out and playing outside. Now it's like, go explore a cave. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. He they, would go with his dad. To, it, I, to be fair, he had what, five brothers and two and two, two sisters? sisters? He wasn't the youngest when um, the event that we're going to happen about hap, uh, happened in the year was 37. But mm -hmm. It was also 1925. What else is your I, kid going to do? I, I, honestly, if you have five, if you have, so this is eight kids. If you have eight kids, hopefully one falls in a cave. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> like I like I I'm I'm just I'm just saying like just hey that's one less mouth to feed. I I saw the picture of the house. It wasn't exactly a mansion. I, no, I, it's not. And I I'm think, not, I'm not I think exactly the kids sure. get an extra three feet of space now. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure where we are in terms of the Great Depression, but it's a common, <laughs> and this is yeah. also a part of the country that is not wealthy it's not even middle class a lot of the time i it didn't look like there were a lot of golden toilets where no where, where he was living there at. would have been one with indoor plumbing <laughs> yeah. um but so when he was six he began exploring these caves and with his father he would go up to the mammoth cave hotel and sell rocks and arrowheads to tourists by 10 he dropped out of school he was like i'm done no more and he would start exploring these caves um, just all by himself, looking for Native American relics. And at 12, he had gotten to know the charted cave systems so well that he started exploring the parts that weren't charted at 12, just kind of venturing off into the unknown. And he would find things like moccasins, tomahawks, beads, footprints, and even the occasional body of a, another explorer that had gone before him. Oh, neat. That's what every little boy wants to find. <laughs> Your moccasins are now my moccasins by way of my actions. Yes. Hook them with a stick and move that, on to the cake. Exactly. That's what little boys do. That, there's nothing like a good set of haunted moccasins. That's, exactly. that, that's what every 12-year-old wants. So at 14, a geologist from New York paid him $2 a day, which I looked it up. That would be about 30 bucks now nowadays. 30 bucks a day? Yeah, but it was two dollars then. But to us now, would be like giving a kid thirty bucks a day to guide. Not, not fourteen, that ain't bad. No, not at all. Thirty bucks yeah. a day when you're fourteen is like woo. Yeah. To guide other geologists around the caving system, because as geologists, they wanted to learn about caves and how to cave safely. But Floyd also learned geology from that. Okay. And Floyd, through working with these, with these geologists came up with the idea that all of the caves in the area were somehow connected. So Floyd was one of those guys who he would squeeze through these creepy, just ugh, cracks that um, other people could not. And he gained a reputation as the greatest caver in Kentucky to the point where they would there's his house, the lovely mm -hmm. Dick, Dick, Dick Collins. Yeah. Where they would, he had postcards made of him. That's just Floyd in the postcard, looking at some stuff in the caves. Um, just, just finding bones. It's a good day for Floyd. It is. I mean, and even now, I mean, I don't know what he did with those bones. Maybe he did some neat arts and crafts with them. I'm I I'm just picturing him going to like Joanne's or Michael's or something, just trying to find something to do with those bones. What like do with these bones? what? Oh God! I feel I see. I'm thinking yarn. I, I I'm thinking something with yarn Halloween's or coming. leaves. Yeah, yeah. Like, I I'm gonna make a wreath. I'm gonna make a bone wreath. Bone wreath. That'd be a lovely yeah. project. By uh, by the way, this is probably a horrible idea, but I do have a bowl of noodles here, which Go I for do. It. I do apologize for That's eating on camera, fine. but I may regret this once we get into me some messed up territory. Okay. So. so now in 1917, he found a beautiful underground canyon with the sheer vertical walls, a ceiling like smooth as plaster and these beautiful brown, white and orange gypsum flowers. Now my understanding is gypsums are kind of fibroid crystal that grows. And they okay. just look like the wall is just covered in these beautiful flowers. Hmm. And so he, it's not an actual flower, it's a crystal. No, it's a crystal okay. that the way it forms kind of looks like these glittering, beautiful flowers just growing okay. all over, brown and white and orange, beautiful. 
And he was like, I found this beautiful cave. Awesome. My family's going to be rich. I'm going to help my family. He named it Crystal Cave, appropriately. Now, the problem okay. with this was that it was very far off the beaten path. There were caves that were closer so that when people were going up and down the highway or the interstate, there were caves that were closer to town. The only way to get to Crystal Cave was by a wagon trail. Floyd saved up his money, bought himself a taxi cab. Floyd was not a good driver. Floyd literally hit the broad side of a barn. What, uh, what year was this? Like, how, how long have cars been around? 1917. So, I mean, it just says that he bought himself a taxi cab. Man, I wish I knew more about cars. I don't know when the first I don't one know came. If this was like I, I would have guessed. I would have guessed 1916. Like, <laughs> like yeah. I have no idea when Henry Ford um, got involved here. Yeah, but he literally hit the broad side of a bar. Mm. So, and it didn't help that other cave owners, because this was like the cave territory, where that's what your family did for the most part. You were cavers, or you made money off of caves. They would um, tell people, "Oh no, Crystal Cave." That's closed, closed, not open. They'd put their wagons and boulders in front of the path so people couldn't go to it. And there was, the article describes them as five goons <laughs> who literally came to Collins and was like, give us the deed, to, the lease to your cave and beat him bloody until his brother Homer chased them off with a shotgun. Good old I'm Homer. Assuming, I'm assuming as was the custom at the time. <laughs> As was the custom at the time. That, that, like, that was essentially them calling the cops. Just your, your brother Homer came with a shotgun. Exactly. Here comes Homer with a shotgun. Yep. So he was determined to, he found this beautiful cave, but he wanted a cave now that he could make money off of and that he could help his family with. And he knew just where to look. Now, this is what the cave looks like today. The entrance okay. of the cave, I should say. Once I can get it to come up. I'm sure there's an easier way to do this, but there's Floyd. Let's see. You're doing a fine job. Don't I'm you? doing my best. That's Floyd in the cave. In my one ass. My not ass. Ne not, ne not necessarily the cave we're going to talk about, but one of them. But this is the entrance to the cave as it looks today. Not necessarily today. I'm not exactly sure when this picture was taken, but it's right around. It's color. It's, it's in color, so that's... It's in color, but I don't know if it was taken like 98 or 99, but mm -hmm. he, on January 30th, 1925, um, he um, had spent, prior to January 30th, he had spent up to 12 hours a day clearing gravel, sandstone, and limestone from that area. He was convinced that that was going to be the best cave, he's gonna make so much money for his family. Um, so on the 30th of January, 1925, he, um, it was a kind of a cold day. It was, well, no, actually it wasn't cold. They say it was unusually warm for January. He takes off his coat, hangs it on a nearby boulder, puts on his kerosene lamp, throws a rope over his shoulder, he goes in, and when he comes out, he would be one of the most famous people in the world. Now, we've got an hour count. <laughs> Right now we're at hour zero okay. and Floyd gets on his hands and knees as these people do. Now when I talk about caving, this is like professional caving. This isn't like stand by me, the Goonies, where it's like, let's go in a cave, fellas. This is hands and knees crawling. You need training. You need a lamp and a helmet and you don't yeah. go alone. You need gear. It's something that's a very serious sport that you don't take lightly which is why Floyd was known as one of the best at the time. Um, there was snow melt because it had snowed, but it was melting. So it was when this, the melted snow uh, melts and it comes through the earth. I guess that's called snow melt in the okay. underground area. Um, he came to a four foot drop and lowered himself down. The cave, and I'm reading this a little bit verbatim, it clamped into a narrow shaft of jagged loose rocks. He dropped on his belly and he army crawled through that. At 50 feet, he encountered what was called the first squeeze. A squeeze in caving is the area where it's like, this takes technique. This is where you have to really know what you're doing. Most people look at that and go, you nope out of there. Yeah. Like, oh, done, can't fit. But with proper technique, he knew that he could get through it. So this was an area with less than eight inches of clearance um, for his head and his back. 
So what he did was he pressed his arms against his side. He exhaled, which is a technique that they use when you go through a, um, a squeeze to completely make yourself as flat as possible because when you exhale, your lungs are, are empty. Right. Um, he rocked his hips and his abdominals and he propelled his body forward with his toes, which just sounds horrifying. It's, it sounds a lot like how people escape from straight jackets, like how, how magicians it, escape from oh, yeah. straight jackets. I mean, they, they big themselves up when they put it on and then they just like wilt themselves in so yeah, they can have I a mean, lot of wiggle basically room. basically flattened himself and he's rocked himself forward enough using his abs and his hips and then just using his toes, he is propelling himself forward which is terrifying. Mm -mm. Um, no. He got a little bigger on the other side and he crawled on his hands and knees, kind of like a, a kid. And then we got to another squeeze. He wiggled through that and he got to what is called a sloping pit, barely wide enough to accommodate his body. Then it dropped to a 10, the pit dropped to 10 feet and curled horizontally into a small cubby hole that ended in a tight crack. His brother Homer later described this as a chimney no bigger around than your body lined with projecting rocks that dig into your flesh and tear into your clothing. And his plan was to bring people into this like a vacation spot? He wanted to see where it went. He didn't okay. want to, This wasn't just like, come on, people bring the family. Like Crystal what? Cave, he had to go someplace to discover this. And then I think they created a better entrance. Okay. Because this was gotcha. like 1925. Ladies are not going down there in their fine. I <laughs> I, I don't think Allie Mae is, is going down there in her gingham gown. Oh, no. You're going to rip your gingham gown. But yeah. basically, this 10-foot um, pit, it's kind of like a chimney. And okay. so when you get there, you can't really, you know, if you're in something like a chimney or a tight, enclosed space, you can't bend at the waist. You know, right. it's basically you got to kind of like lay down and shoot yourself in kind of like a water slide. Sure. A um, lot less fun. A lot less fun. Uh, a um, water slide with jagged rocks. A jagged rock water slide. He had spent the previous day. <laughs> that's, more, that's more like a slip and slide that, that your dad didn't check before he put down. <laughs> or just do that. He had spent the previous day removing rocks from this area, and he really wanted to see what was on the other side. As now, you do. I, I, now we finally look passable. He put himself down feet first and wiggled through. Um, it says here, rocks compressed his torso and loose stones dangled millimeters from his neck which sounds delightful. It really does. Um, it dumped him out onto a ledge. And when he brought his lamp forward, he could see that he was in a large room that dropped approximately 60 feet. So he was like, bingo, I found this awesome, great room, just like I found the Crystal Cave. He um, was super jazzed to explore it. So he put a rope around a boulder and he starts to rappel down. But then he notices that his lantern, the kerosene is low and it's going to die. So he decides to go back. Um, he pulled himself and then up to the ledge, and then he started going forward on the horizontal crack. He laid down, flipped on his back, and pushed the lantern in front of him. Squeezed his arms at his sides, he exhaled, and then pushed him forward, and then the cave went completely dark. He had knocked over his lantern. As you do. Yep. Now, this darkness is the kind of darkness that I can only imagine is unfathomable. Oh, yeah. Like, just, just imagining it scares the hell out of me. The, this will scare you even more, the fish in the underground rivers of Kentucky have evolved so that they don't have eyes. They have no need for them. <laughs> they, okay. So you're, liter like, well, eyes you're literally in a monster cave yes. in the dark. Okay, good. Yeah. Floyd didn't panic. This isn't the first time he's been caught without some light. He of course. Favor. Good old Floyd. He, um, wormed his way forward towards the bottom of that 10-foot pit. He dug his foot against what he thought was the cave wall. Mm-hmm. Turned out it was an eyeless fish. No, <laughs> it was, yes. No, but he pushed off what he thought was the cave wall. A rock crumbled, and suddenly his left ankle was throbbing. He instinctively did that thing where you push with your feet, kind of paddle with your feet, trying to push it off. Sure. Um, but it didn't work. Every time he moved, more gravel and rock fell down around him. Um, his legs and his waist. And every movement seemed to lodge the rock tighter in the crevice. Um, he w tried to move forward. He tried to move backwards. He couldn't move. He was at the his head was at the bottom of this 10-foot pit. And it says the rest of this tunnel hugged his body like a straitjacket. Nope. And his left arm was pinned under his torso, and his right was on the rock ceiling above him. He couldn't reach behind or ahead of him, and he couldn't roll over. 
whenever he tried to move, the rocks tumbled around him. They tumbled behind the rock that was trapping him and they piled at his feet and underneath him rocks, like razor-like rocks dug into his skin. So this is just delightful. Um, this is when he began to understandably freak out. <laughs> I'm, I'm just picturing him completely just pressed up against jagged rock and jagged rock, just thinking to himself, there are days, then there are days. Where's that and, car? Yeah. Um, he started to panic. I really hope this was a Monday. So he, he, can, <laughs> be like the exactly he can be the original Garfield. Man, just, just, a, just a picture of him in the cave going, man, I hate Mondays. I hate Mondays. <laughs> um, he clawed at the wall so much that his fingernails broke and just blood seeped. Oh, God, no. Ew. He began to sweat, and then he began to shiver. Then exhaustion finally set in, and he began the nightmarish cycle of sleep wake, scream, sleep, wake, scream. He eventually yeah. completely lost his voice. And the only thing he knew was that his arms tingled and there was pain on his ankle. So how, how deep into the cave is he at this point? He is Do we 60 know? feet down. 60 feet down, okay. Yep. Le actually, I missed that, but let me share this lovely graphic because... Oh, I'm looking forward to this. It is. There's, there's, there's more terrifying ones, I promise. Good. But this is a little bit of a map of what it looks like. So this is where Floyd went in. That's the first drop. Crawling, crawling, we're 12, 20 feet, do, do, do. drop, do, 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 do. 32 feet, 40 feet. This is that 10 foot vertical drop. Mm -hmm. He wasn't trapped upside down. That's just the way this diagram is displayed. He was almost, he was basically lying down, lying flat. Okay. Uh, 60 feet down, and that's the 10 foot vertical drop. Okay. So that is just, I'm sure, if you have claustrophobia. I mean, 60 feet, if you think about it, I mean, people have been trapped under, for, under deeper. Yeah. But this was like the worst way to get trapped. So for the next 25 hours, the only thing Floyd would have to remind him of the world above was a steady trickle of water, of snow melt that just dropped on his face, which is great. You have water, but that's also a form of torture. That's also the Chinese water torture. Yeah, that's yeah. also. Um, so. Is that racist now? I don't. That's why I just said it's a form of uh, torture, so I don't know. If that's racist now, I apologize. Yeah, the, I'm not sure what the term is. I know it's not waterboarding, but. Yeah, no, it's not. Waterboarding is, is when it feels like you're drowning. Yes. So. I but just know. that little drop hitting yeah. you for so long. Um, so we're now at hour 25. It wasn't unusual for Floyd to disappear for long periods of time, even days at a time when he was exploring. He would, that was when, you, when you're a caver. Yeah, when his, um, he would have like friends and family throughout the area and he'd come out one night in one area and spend the night there and then go down and come out in another person's area. Um, people started to worry around hour 25. It's like Bugs Bunny just yeah. going under the he dirt. Actually, he just I pops up. People would actually, um, in the article, there were stories where he would pop up in somebody's hay field like a, like a, <laughs> like a gopher, and then just go back Whoops. down. That's, that's Floyd, kid. Took a, took a wrong turn in Albuquerque. In Albuquerque, yep. So around hour 25, a 17-year-old boy named Jewel Estes um, heard, he knew that Floyd was working on this cave, so he decides to go and check it out. Um... They soon would give the cave the name Sand Cave. So whenever I refer to Sand Cave from now on, that is the cave that Floyd is trapped in. Okay. He, Jewel Estes, was 17, and he was he is described as live, but he's inexperienced as a caver. Um, he made his way down. He didn't make his way all the way to Floyd. That last squeeze kind of freaked him out, understandably. But he heard, he yelled Floyd's name. And Floyd yells, come to me, I'm hung up. <laughs> okay. As he is. So um, Jules, Jewel runs out of the cave, crawls. I shouldn't say runs because you can't even stand. And he goes and he gets, he's like, everybody, Floyd's stuck. Floyd's stuck. <laughs> Floyd. <laughs> I'm fixing the whole town. Like, of course he's stuck. Of course you're stuck. So, um... One by one, a bunch of men went in to get Floyd, and each of them emerged just 
caked and soaked in mud, swearing they will never go back down that godforsaken hole ever again. Um, dozens of people tried, and there was a crowd now gathering outside the cave. All of them failed to reach Floyd. One man said, I wouldn't go back there for a cold thousand bad as I need the money. Um, so now Jerry, I'm sorry, I don't know, I think I'm thinking Jerry Bruckheimer, but it's Roger, Roger Brucker told Lucas Riley in an email that most Kentucky caves are, dis are dissolved out of solid limestone and perfectly safe, whether small or large. Sand Cave is a pile of sandstone and limestone breakdown blocks with mud fill holding the matrix together. It was more of a tunnel than a cave. And the loose ceiling of crumbling, tumbling rocks scared everyone who entered. It's one thing to go into something that's like solid stone, but it's another sure. thing that it's like crawling through like a sand castle. Yeah, yeah, yeah like, it it's like quick, made, it's quick sand. Yeah, it wasn't made of sand. But just because of the crumbling nature of it, they gave it the name Sand Cave, which kind of yeah. sucks that Floyd didn't even get to name his own cave. That does suck. <laughs> that is a shame. He I'm going to call like, it Floyd like, Crap. This is Floyd Cave. Nope, Sand Cave, Floyd. Sorry. You, you missed it, Floyd. So now, around this time at 4 o'clock, our good buddy Homer arrives. Homer is Oh, good old good. Homer. And he has a good boy with him. He does, and I was, when I read, read Trap, there's um, stories about, I don't know, it might have been this dog, because um, it kind of looks a little bit like a Chinese uh, crusted chow. There was a dog that wasn't gonna, it was Floyd's dog not gonna leave that cave. And so that's like, aw. Yeah, good the dog. The goodest of boys. Mm-hmm. Um, he, Homer, came out and he looked around at all these people just bickering, trying to figure out what to do, and he was like, forget you guys. He went down in his city clothes, because <laughs> he was coming from Louisville, which I guess was the big city. Yeah, uh, that's fair. And he was no slouch. I mean, it wasn't just like, you know, like, your, your brother's a doctor and you're not a doctor. You know, you can't just step in and go and, oh, yeah, you know, got the surgery. He was a caver, too. He was um, no slouch at all, certainly. He stopped. He went into the cave, but he stopped when he got to that 10-foot pit above his brother's head. For some reason, and no one's quite sure why, he took off his shirt, pants, and shoes. Maybe because they were his good clothes, but I'm feeling as deep as you're in the cave now, buddy, <laughs> that city clothes is ruined. In but for a dime, in for a dollar. Yep, he went in in his underwear. Um, and according to the authors of Trap, um, the site made Homer shudder. This is what is gonna, this is what Homer, came to when there we go zoom that's homer with the mm. goodest of boys this is how homer was trapped not oh. homer, sorry, floyd right so here you can see like you can lay down mm -hmm. it's at a slant so even if it's like a it's not straight like a chimney and most men are, even though it's 10 foot tall, you're not gonna be able to bend over. That's how Floyd, who has now grown a beard for some reason, um, is trapped. The rock is on his foot and he's laying like that and there's all this gravel just stuck around him. Ugh. Um, you couldn't really, there, there was no really, not really a good way to go down because um, if you go down head first, then you're gonna have to propel yourself out backwards. Yeah. And they said, if you went out backwards, um, if you went in head first and you had to get a propel yourself out, you would have to crawl backwards 20 feet before you could turn around. If you went in feet first, there was just really nothing you could, it, what are you going to do? <laughs> you know? it's like, yeah. But um, what was worse was that the way he was positioned, you probably saw in that graphic, Floyd kind of blocked his own rescue. Yeah. You know? They can't get to those rocks and everything around him very easily. Um, anytime you, um, people tried to move these rocks that were around Floyd, more would fall down. Homer, being uh, the good brother, realizing his uh, brother hadn't probably eaten, he called for someone to bring him down some food, and they brought him nine sausage sandwiches, oh. which Homer fed him by hand. I'm, um, it said that he kind of like Homer stood with his feet on either side of Floyd's head and kind of fed him that way, and then poured a pint of coffee down his throat. Good Lord. 
<laughs> coffee doesn't seem like something you want to pour. You know, it's like that old coffee. You know, it's like that yeah, it's like that that, that. that he's not pouring a latte down there. No, that, that's no, just no caramel macchiato. No, that's just black. That's just black death. He's pouring down his throat. Yes, but he was at least getting some some sustenance. So, yes. I mean, if I he's got that lovely snow drip. So now we've got a little bit of coffee to keep things going. Homer in Mer nine sausage sandwiches. That, that's a lot of sausage sandwiches. I like to think that they're like the little sandwiches, like the breakfast sandwiches, but they're probably like the little Chick Fil A ones. But they're probably not. <laughs> hey, even still, nine. That's a that's, but that's a lot. Eaten in like almost a two days. I guess, but I think they were trying to also keep his strength up. Okay, fair enough. Homer emerged hours later, looking like that. That this is Homer Collins right here. Mm -hmm. But that is what he looked like when he emerged. Um, he was shivering violently. I will. I would imagine that they had um, like a coat and stuff ready for him when he came out because he was in his underpants. Right. Um, skin was dangling from his fingers because he was trying his best to claw out the area around his brother. Mm -hmm. Um. Well. Homer recuperated at the edge of the mouth cave because he wasn't going too far. He's like, that's my brother in there. I'm not leaving this cave too long. More people tried to go in. They all failed. Nobody Can we just take a minute to stop and say what a good dude Homer is? He chased off the guys with a shotgun. He feeds his brother by – he pours coffee down his throat. His, ruins his suit? He, ru he ruins a city suit. He's, uh, uh, he has literally skeleton fingers now. Yep. I mean, Homer is a good dude. There are a lot of good dudes in this story. And that's one of the reasons that I really, really like the musical is that it's a great story about, a, in a lot of senses, a community coming together, about family, about helping people that you don't really know. But... What, uh, uh, what's the musical called? It's called Floyd Collins. Oh, okay. I'm going to link... <laughs> that's pretty straightforward. <laughs> In the description, um, I'm going to link, there's a wonderful version of a song that's sung between Homer and Floyd. At this point, actually, in the story, it's called The Riddle Song, where Floyd's kind of going in and out of consciousness, and Homer's telling him riddles. He's telling him these riddles, like, talk to me. Talk to me, brother. You know, I'm going to give you a riddle, and you're going to give me the answer. And they're kind of going back and forth, and it's a great song. And I'll try to link a playlist to the albums, because it's great. As a man who hates riddles, I'd rather be in the cave. <laughs> Shut up! <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I, I guess, is, is, is it a giant? I don't know. So nobody, after Homer went out, nobody reached Floyd again until Homer went back in again at midnight. Homer went back in again at midnight, and for eight hours, this man white-knuckled a crowbar and hacked at the rocks that were clamped around his brother's chest. Um, when he emerged on um, the morning of February 1st, there was a ton of people he didn't know. It was like you went in to just like your friends and your family. He comes out and he's like, who are all these people? We're now at hour 48 that Floyd has been trapped, our buddy Floyd. Um, lots of people are throwing around ideas at this time. One genius suggested that Floyd should untie his shoes. Like, oh, your foot's caught, just untie your shoe, you'll slip out, you'll be fine. Yeah. Another suggested that they find a contortionist and send the contortionist down with a mallet and chisel. They talked about using TNT and they argued about cave ends. Some talked about using gas torches and then, oh, but then we've got gas poisoning. Some argued about using amputation. And, but then we got to worry about blood loss. A um, hundred people, men, it says men, <laughs> stood outside, and I'm imagining on the edges are, are the women folk, you know? <laughs> They're hankies, yeah. fretting over Floyd. Um, I, I'm, I'm picturing that the women just, uh, like, uh, all these, uh, well, we got the genius bar over here, and then all the women are just like, untie the shoes, eh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that ain't okay. No yeah, That's okay. Oh, oh I, I, yeah, contortionist. We'll, uh, we'll go get Bendy Jim down there. It's going to work <laughs> out just... It's gonna work out just sure fine. He was in here two weeks ago. I know we just missed him. Well, now, I get these get are line tamer. This part is it says that these people were basically drinking, squabbling, and failing to turn words into action. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, and that's, that's America. <laughs> America. Um, Homer was really upset and really disappointed in his community at this point. Um, 
he had, after his shift, he was too, ex too exhausted to make a second trip for a little bit. So he handed some teenage boys uh, blankets and food and said, could you please go down and just give these to Floyd? Um, teenagers though, being teenagers where they quite haven't developed that sense of empathy yet. Um, they got there and it's understandable that they may have freaked out a little bit, but rather than saying, Homer, we tried, I can't do it. I'm really, really sorry. I want to, but I, I just can't. I'm too scared. They shoved the food and blankets in cracks. And then they said, oh yeah, we gave them to Floyd. He, he just ate them up real quick. He's so happy with his new blanket. Later, um, Homer would send down more grown men to give him foods and blankets. And these grown men also lied and just shoved the food and blankets in cracks in the cave. Why, well, why don't they just eat the food? Well, well, why are they shoving it in cracks? I don't know. I mean, I can understand. Homer's going to go by later and be like, hey, look, uh, nine more sausage sandwiches just so, shoved into a rock. Nobody, with the exception of his brother, reached Floyd on February 1st. He spent, Homer spent the night removing, Sunday night, removing the rocks. The following morning, he was sitting near a low-lying campfire, and this little baby-faced reporter from the Louisville Courier Journal approaches him. And he says, I hear that you are the brother of a fellow who is trapped in a cave. This is not a time when Homer wants to be giving interviews. He's just harumphing at him saying, you know, fine, whatever. Finally, Homer turns to this kid and he says, if you want information, there's a hole right down over there. You can go down and find out for yourself. And this kid who was a mere 21 years old was named and it's another favorite i shouldn't say character because he is a an actual human being this was william burke miller 21 years old who was a reporter for, for the is that is that him at 21 i think so we've got some this is like his headshot it may I, have been I, I'm just saying that that's him at 21. He's got some city miles on him. That's a he is that's a, a city boy. Um, <laughs> that's a face that's that, that that face has seen some things. He looks like Gary Cooper. Yep, he's 21, and normally he wrote for the Louisville Courier Journal. He didn't even get his name in the byline. Um, but when he heard that, hey, there's a man down in Kentucky, in Cape City, trapped, he was like, "I'll go. I'll take care of it." William Burke Miller. He was nicknamed Skeets. Skeets. Because he was so small. He was, I think, I want to say like five, 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 mid around there, and 117 pounds. He was he had this wiry kind of mosquito-like frame. And that's one I love this character in the in the show as well. He's it's gotta be a very specific physical type, but also because the score is very, very demanding. This is a very demanding score. But Homer said, if you want an interview, go down in that hole. He's right down there. It's this kid, baby face. You know, he's got that slick back hair. He's got his fine khaki suit. Homer never expected this kid to go over, take off his jacket, put on a pair of coveralls and crawl down in the dang cave. But that is exactly what Skeet did. He was scared. He was nervous because this is like a city boy. He has never gone in a cave. Yeah, go, go Skeet. He follows the path and he called for Floyd and Floyd goes, uh-huh. And he inhaled and he slid down that 10 foot pit and landed right on Floyd's head. Jesus. And this is a, 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 a song that's very interesting in the show called I Landed On Him. <laughs> he apologizes and then he goes Put back. The candle back. I'm not sure if he went in feet first or head first, but either way, you just slide down into the darkness of this pit and you hit a man in the head that's been trapped under there for. Two and a half days. I'm picturing Floyd being like, well, at least it can't get worse. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he apologized and um Floyd, I guess, accepted that apology. He went back up and re <laughs> What's he gonna do? <laughs> no, you no go Christmas away. <laughs> um he slid down and he again more carefully and he tried asking Floyd questions, but Floyd was incoherent at this point. So he took some mental notes and he goes out of the cave. It took him a half an hour to get out of the cave. Now, the physical and psychological toil of climbing in and out of sand cave 
would exhaust Skeets Miller, but it would also really benefit in his reporting. He immediately understood how kind of brave and talented and fearless Floyd was by going through this. And he also realized just how difficult it would be to get him out. Because I mean, even as a not, even someone who's like a non-caving person, he was like, this is, this is foobar. Yeah. <laughs> this is no good. Um, so Homer sees Skeet come out. He is muddy and numb. He's shocked. And <laughs> I like to think Homer did one of these. He's like, this kid might be useful. <laughs> He's like five, I'm going to strap some sausages on this kid. <laughs> he's five, five and 117 pounds. He's, he's a little thing, but he's, but he's smart, you know, because he's 21. He's, he's an adult. So at hour 43, Floyd starts to lose it. I'm sorry, hour 73. He says he is seeing angels wrapped in white linen, um, and messengers are riding blazing chariots and leaving trails as their chariots go by, the smell of liver and onions off a hot griddle, freshly frothed cow's milk, and that's hot, heaven. And hot that's, chicken sandwiches. That's heaven, all right. They were all hallucinations, but it was probably better than the reality. Uh, yeah. <laughs> There's sometimes where madness is preferable to uh, they, uh, The brain's a wonderful thing. Let's not think about what's going on. Let's, uh, uh, you know, Angel you know, ladies. It's, awesome. You know what's great? Angels with liver and onions. Yes. Wouldn't that be so, wonderful? <laughs> Let's think about on, that for the next two hours. On Monday, February 2nd, Skeets was the first outsider. Now comes Lieutenant Robert Brunden, who is a 33-year-old Louisville firefighter who was just talked and told it like it is, and he was like, we're going to do this, this, and this. Um, he went in to save Floyd, but he, like, Floyd, like um, Skeet, he was able to reach Floyd. So he looks at the situation and he says, you've got a hell of a problem here. Understatement. And he says, but I think we can get you out. And so Floyd's like, fine. Remember, he's seen angels and selling liver and onions. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> fine. All right. I'm kind, I'm kind of fine. Just leave me here. But then he looks around. He gets a little bit better gander at the situation. He goes, we might have to pull your foot off. Yeah. Floyd's like, pull my foot off. Just, just get me out. We don't know if Burden knew that Floyd was not of sound mind, you know? Um, but he returned to the surface and he was like, this is what we're gonna do. Floyd says, it's okay. Um, and the crowd of locals were like, pull his foot off? Yeah. That, it's, that's kind of medieval. Pull is much different than cut. Exactly. Cut, ow, then we leave. Pull, that, that's about, like taffy. Everyone, I like that you said taffy and you'll figure out why. I don't um, like that. A lot of people were like, well, is he just gonna like, after you pull him out, is he just gonna like slug his way up, like blood trailing behind him? If we, and then others like, if we pull him out, those rocks are gonna fillet him. You know, these sharp rocks, he's just gonna get filleted. A doctor <laughs> offered an opinion. He said, if you pull him out like that, his internal organs will stretch like taffy. <laughs> Think of him smoking a pipe while he says that. Well, the insides are made of taffy. If you pull him out like that, his insides are going to stretch like taffy. Because <laughs> that we all I, know. I, I don't know why he's from Maine, but that's... <laughs> is it, is it um, who is it? Judd Crandall from... Uh, yeah. That's a yeah. Turn, yeah. monster? Well, uh... <laughs> so, but he was like this, but Burden was like, this is the only other option. The locals' ideas dried up days ago, so it's hour 79... Um, at 5 at 5 p.m., a special body harness was brought in, and into the cave went Homer, Skeets Miller, and Lieutenant Burden. They went into the darkness with a hundred foot rope. Homer went the way, led the way, and to calm his brother's nerves, he gave him ham sandwiches, coffee, and some whiskey, <laughs> because they're going to be pulling you out. Hey, you know what? He's earned it. Yep. Um, relaxed. And kind of brought back to his sentence by the senses, by the food, and by the company, Collins confesses that he doesn't want his foot pulled off. Um, Homer listens to his brother, and then he gave Floyd another thing to eat, which we assume was another hand sandwich, which had a sedative in it. So that's always good. In Burden's word, this sedative was designed to build up his vitality, to stand the shock of having his foot pulled off. I don't know any drug, even in modern medicine. <laughs> Yeah. Other than like completely numbing or going into complete shock. Yeah. But Homer put the 
harness around uh, Floyd's chest, knotted the rope. Miller, Skeets was at the top of the pit and Bergen was further up the cave and they have this, um, this rope going up kind of like a big tug of war. Um, on Homer's count, they pulled. Floyd starts screaming. As you do. Screaming. Burden's up there like, keep going, keep going, keep going. Skeets is pulling as hard as his little self can. And Homer, unable to, his, home, Floyd is screaming, don't do it, don't do it. The whole cave is just filled with screams. And Homer, unable to bear his brother in this pain, somehow summons the strength and the effort and he yanks that thing and the whole rope comes back to him. Mm. So, I mean, considering there were guys on the outside pulling too, it wasn't just the three of them. It is, that's, that's one of those feats of adrenaline. Yeah. Um, so he pulled everything, no progress is made. The team decides to leave and reevaluate the situation. <laughs> Everybody- Time out, time out guys, time out. <laughs> Project Taffy is no go. Wait, 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 let's, let's, uh, Oh, let's just figure this out for a second. <laughs> we got some, someone get a stick. I need to draw in the mud. <laughs> but um, men were shaken by this experience. Just the sound of those screams were, um, Burton fainted coming out, sure. the police officer. Most of the men had to be carried away. They were just so freaked out and traumatized by this. Now, outside the crowd is milling and get, getting their little gossipies along. Um, but milling through this throng was the one person left who could liberate Floyd, or at least try to, and that was... Superman. I don't think Superman was around at this point. <laughs> and that's how Superman was created. Yes, he zoomed in, and this man was named Johnny Gerald. Who Handsome is, fella. I think this is much later in his life than now, um, but this is Floyd's childhood boyhood friend, bestest buddy, um, almost like a brother. Actually, in the musical, the character of Johnny, Gerald, and Homer are combined into the character of Homer, mm. just because that's what you got to do dramatically sometimes. Poor Johnny, um, Gerald. Yep, we are now at hour 88. <laughs> when Johnny first heard that Floyd was stuck, he was chaperoning a boy's um, basketball outing, and he heard Floyd was stuck, and he was like, mm, Floyd's stuck. Floyd gets stuck. It's no big deal. He'll figure it out. He's I'll keep an eye on it. Keep an eye on it. Um, two days later, he's like, I need to go check this situation out. This is not good for old Lloyd Floyd. It is now a drunken crowd of 200 people, all of whom have no caving experience. And he is just appalled. He's like, this is a thing for cavers and no one thought to call in a caver, someone who knows what they're doing. Um, and so when the rope crew, when the people with the rope, with the exception of Homer and Skeets left, everyone looks at Johnny. <laughs> like, you, Johnny, you're our man now. Yeah. Went into the cave and he found all the food and all the blankets that had been left behind. The Lee family, I'm sorry, the Collins family patriarch, Lee, said enough sandwiches in the cave to feed the entire crowd outside. I, I'm just picturing like Castlevania when like you whip a wall and there's like a pork chop in the wall. I'm picturing him just like finding sausage sandwiches, like awesome. Can, can, that would piss me off, you know? That would make me so mad. Yeah, you know, like my, my best friend is down here. They sent you down with this stuff, and you couldn't even like sh like attempt like throw it, try to throw it down the hall. <laughs> yeah, you just shoved fair. it in a cave, shoved it in a crack. So. John, uh, Floyd hears Johnny's voice and he immediately yells, let him down here. He'll get me out. Now, Jer Johnny was a, was a stocky guy. He could get through the squeezes, but he couldn't fit down that 10 foot pit. But for three hours, that man pried rocks away with his bare hands. And around midnight, he has managed to move enough rock that he can get down and begin removing gravel around Floyd's body. He would spend the next six hours down there trying to enlarge the trap. And I don't have a graphic of this, so I'm going to use my hands and I'm going to be a polite person. But like basically Floyd's head is here mm -hmm. and Johnny's head is here. So they're kind of like that. 
Mm -hmm. It's that kind of a thing where he's just basically laying on top of him like that, hauling out rock and gravel around his friend. Um, I, I'm picturing um, the Simpsons when Bart was in the well and Sting is like digging him out. That's, that's kind of what I'm picturing. Yes. Yeah. Um, he managed to get his torso free and his hip and his upper thighs. For a little bit, he could wiggle his right leg, though it hurt him. Same with his arm and hands. Floyd could wiggle those. Um, but he was too big to reach past Floyd's knees. But he moved by hand half a ton of rock. That's when Jer when Johnny said to Floyd, look, buddy, I got to leave. He said, Johnny, don't let anyone come down here but you or your boys. You know, just like. That's fair. You're my butt. You're my boy, Johnny. <laughs> you're my boy. I he can't believe it took him 90 hours to figure out let's bring in a caver. This, this, this will be one of the things of this story, which is also very prominent in the musical as well. And I imagine it's also, um, it's been a while since I've seen Ace in the Hole, but it's, um, it's an issue that comes up, but when Johnny comes out, he was convinced that outsiders with no caving experience, as good as your intentions may be, you're gonna cause a cave-in. A team of professional stonecutters shows up and Johnny just pointed them to the road. Like, get out of here. You don't yeah. know. You know, you may have your fancy science degrees, but I've lived in these caves. I know what makes them fall in. I know what makes them, you know, and especially this cave, which it's, it's so loosely held together. Um, while Johnny slept, the locals acted as gatekeepers. Basically, Lieutenant Burden, the fireman, who had the great pull off his foot idea, um, comes back at 10 a.m. and he pitches the, the rope scheme again. The locals scream obscenities at him and tell him to get out of here. Um, basically, we'd, when Johnny showed up on the scene, Burden had no more power. His, his authority was neutered. Um, this is kind of, but for all of his stupid schemes, he was still a fireman. Burden was still a fireman. He was a person trained in rescue but not caving. And that's kind of one right. of the big things here is we have great people who are great cavers, but no knowledge of the proper way to rescue or how to organize rescue. Then we've got great rescuers who just don't know anything about caving. And they're just too proud or too, it, it, it's like if you had just collaborated. Yeah. <laughs> maybe it would have it's been like, it's, a, it's essentially every serial, a serial killer case until like 1992. Yes. It's like, if, if you would just talk to each other, we could get some people you in could on figure it. something out. Yeah. But, um, but with the thing with the locals guarding this and saying only Johnny and so-and-so and so-and-so and Frank and Bob and so-and-so can go in, Homer and, and Johnny, had, they had to sleep, even if it just exhaustion took over their body. To, to save Floyd, they needed their strength, they needed their wits, they needed to sleep. The Skeets had to go file his story. So nobody on, in, um, on February 3rd saw, went down to see Floyd at all. Just nobody. But now by this time, this is when America was getting the first news of Floyd Collins. Hour 103, <laughs> since he went I, down. I was, I was about to say, if we had an hour. Yep. Um, Skeets, um, wrote his article, the Associated Press picked it up and it was just everywhere. It was on every newspaper. And for a 21 year old reporter who never had a byline before, this should have been like the best day of Skeet's life. But he was too focused on planning a rescue. So when he showed up at Sand Cave the next day, cause he was one of the people that was like Johnny's people. He said, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna make a chain of guys, of men. And they're gonna pass food and equipment and rocks up and down the passageway. And when our hands aren't full, we're gonna reinforce the cave walls with boards so they don't fall in on us. Um, he would attempt to, uh, Skeets would go down and try to attempt to remove more of the debris around Floyd's body. But, and because Miller was smaller than uh, Homer and Johnny, he could get past Floyd's, Floyd's knees. He could get there. Um, he couldn't really poke his head in, but if he kind of did one of those, like if you sit like if you sit on someone's lap, 
and you wriggle, 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 and then you kind of dig them out. That's kind of how we did it. Oh, I've um, been there, sister. <laughs> we've all been there. Yep. Um, he passed up buckets and buckets of dirt and rocks for two hours. Eventually, um, he took a break. And I don't think these two go together, but he asked for some milk and some whiskey to be brought down to him and Floyd. I just feel like that would curdle. I just feel like that's cool. that's uh yeah, right? I mean like milk and vodka, that's that, like like that's a that's a white Russian. You just add some clue in there. Milk and whiskey. Um so as they kind of were taking a break and drinking and relaxing. That, that is a cool name for a band, though. We're Milk and Whiskey. We're here to rock your faces off. Like, that's a good band name, Milk and Whiskey. So as they're taking a break and Floyd is, starts kind of spilling his heart out to, to, to Skeets. And he says, I, Floyd says, I believe what I, I would go to heaven. But I can feel that I am to be taken out alive and with both my feet. He's, yeah, he's a very positive person. He is. Um, he tells Skeets, I want you to tell everybody outside that I love them. And I am happy because so many are trying to help me. Tell them that I am not going to give up, that I am going to fight and be patient and never forget them. You can go out now, but don't leave me too long. I want you with me and I'll keep helping all I can to move some of this rock. So, um... Thanks to these few moments, it transformed Floyd Collins' story from just kind of like a nationwide curiosity to a huge event. In LA to New York, front pages described the plight of this man stuck. It was you, the font used was the font that was usually reserved for declarations of war. Hmm. So Skeets was quite the, uh, quite the writer. If I can flip this page, let's see. Um, and, Brooker says that the thing about this that really struck people was that back then, reporters, you reported the facts. It was unbiased. You didn't put your own feelings into it. But Skeets did. When he wrote this story, he wrote about the fear and the determination and the hope and, you know, the, the, the elation and then the disappointment. And that's kind of what really sucked people in. It wasn't just like, let's open the paper today and see what's going on. It's like, what's happening to Floyd today? You know, what happened overnight? What did I miss? People, it's one of those things where they were sitting on the edge of their seats, you know, just waiting to see. Um, and because of this, um, at one point, a um, Chicago booking office approached Floyd with the offer of a $350 a week to star in a vaudeville show. He had other things to consider at the time. I'm picturing the curtain is open and he's just under a bunch of rocks, like, yep, this is what it was. Am I right? Yep. And, and then he just got like I, I, like a kick line behind him. Yes. <laughs> but um, the only part, like, it was just building up all this hysteria. But Skeet, remarkably, was not phased by any of it. He was like, I came here to report a story. Now I'm here to, to end it. In a good way, not like shoot him in the head. So I'm here to end it. <laughs> Go, this goes into the cave. <laughs> We're now I mean, I, 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 at 45 minutes, that's what, I w that's what I would have asked for. Just end it now. Um, we're now at 108, 108 hours in. And Miller told his, tells his readers, I believe we can get to him. I believe we can save him yet. I know it. Um, so just hours after this went to print, Skeets was back in that cave with his human chain. He planned to crawl in feet first on top of Floyd, wedge a crowbar against the rock, and use a jack to lift the stone off of Floyd's feet. Pretty, pretty decent idea, I guess. There's worse ones, such but, as the taffy pole. <laughs> great taffy pole. But the team couldn't find the appropriately sized jack. So Skeets was like, we'll improvise. He gets an undersized jack and resorts to piling wood under it to um, make it fit against the cave ceiling. So he's grasping the blocks with one hand and wrenching the jack with another. Um, so around midnight, Skeets begins this rescue attempt. The tools expand, the crowbar clenches, and then it listed as the side slip loose. He learned that performing this activity in such an awkward position on top of another man, laying, and just, I, it, it just caused him so much pain in his 
back, his neck, his wrists, his fingers. But he was like, I'm going to ignore this pain until I can't ignore it no more. Um, cause the rock kept slipping. It just, the, the size of the jack wasn't right. It wasn't the best working conditions. Um, he tried a new angle. He clenched the loose block, wooden blocks and twisted the wrench. The jack pressed against the crowbar and Collins looked back and he saw the stone tremble and he, he called Skeets fella. That was just kind of his nickname. He was like, keep on going, fella. You can do it. Keep on coming, fella. Um, he had never... Her, um, Lieutenant Burden, who was the jerk firefighter who had the great pulling idea, he joined the human chain. So good for him, you know? Okay. Good for him. He said, I, 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 never, I, I, I don't think he, he had the best ideas, but it sounds like he had the best But he's willing intention. to help. He's, he's yeah. like, I want to help rescue this man. Yeah. He said, um, I never heard anything so glad in my life as when he told Fellow, as he called Skeets, that rock was coming, that that rock was coming off his foot. Skeets tried. His back was screaming, rivets of sweat poured down his face and burned his eyes. And then it, it, it's one of those things where it's almost like one of those moments in the movies, it's, it's coming up, it's coming up, it's coming up. And it fell back down. Mm. And Floyd is like, I believe in you fella, you can do it, we got this, it's great. But Collins couldn't give him what he really needed, which was a third hand. And so at 1 a.m., Skeets collapses from exhaustion. He can't move. The rock hasn't moved. And Burden says, we all just felt like sitting down and crying. It was that awful. That's fair. So before he leaves, Skeet adjusts Floyd's blanket, his covers, and he loops a light bulb around his neck for warmth. Because it's still February. It's still chilly. Oh, yeah, Lord. He crawled out of the sand cave. His hands were purple and bruised. And he saw... The National Guard had arrived. <laughs> Are they going to hour... shoot the rocks? <laughs> We're now at hour 112 since poor Floyd went into that. You didn't answer that, and that concerns me. I don't know. <laughs> they didn't shoot the rocks. No, actually, they, they, okay. there's something they do talk about during the rocks. Skeets was super popular at this point in Cave City, to the point where he had an unofficial bodyguard. Um. Turns, scoots. Sc scoots, skeets. He would, he would get swarmed. Skeets and his bodyguard scoots. Scoots the bodyguard, yeah. He would, he would be swarmed whenever he left his hotel and people wanted to talk to him. What's the latest? What have you heard about Floyd? And he was just like, I got to go finish saving Floyd, if you don't mind. Helping Floyd. Um, I got rocks to jack. I got rocks to jack. But when he returned on Wednesday morning, there was a new figure in command and his name was Henry Carmichael. Carmichael was the general superintendent of the Kentucky Rock and Asphalt Company. And he had been kind of watching the site since Tuesday, and he was appalled by this primitive technique, as he thought it was. Um, he had sent men to help shore up the cave with wooden boards. And at 2.30 a.m., shortly after Skeet's jack attempt failed, he sent two men into the cave to assess the structure's stability, which is probably something we should have done much earlier. Yeah, that probably should have been uh, right, right, right at the top. Right near the top. Um, these men probably had the easiest time traveling through it because it kind of had been worn at this point, at least for the first hundred feet. Um, the cave was wider than ever thanks to the removal efforts of the human chain. And now they had kind of like old like mine walls, you know, the wood shoring to keep everything yeah. from falling in. At the final squeeze though, now, but the, here's the thing. The cave was usually at a balmy, I believe 54 degrees. That's what kind of held everything in place. And I'm not a science person. <laughs> I went to school for theater. Putting people in the cave, a lot of people, Gonna make that temperature go up. Probably. Yes. Um, there were also campfires above the cave, which makes the snow melt more into the tunnel and makes the temperature and the moisture content fluctuate. Mm. And this is what started to cause things to kind of fall apart inside this sand cave. It's because wood uh, warps. Even not, not even just the wood, but like as they got further into the cave, 
the temperature is going up because there are people towards the front of the cave, more people, more body heat, it raises. There are campfires above the cave, which is heating mm -hmm. up the earth and causing the snow to melt, which is giving it moisture, which is causing it to break apart further. Right. So these guys get in, and at the final squeeze, they notice these large cracks are forming, and the ceiling of the cave begins to droop. One of these guys looks up, nopes. He was like, nope. He heard Collins moaning, but he also heard the rumble of sliding rock. And he turned around. He was like, nope. The second volunteer was named Casey Jones, whether of Ninja Turtles hey, or, Casey Jones. or baseball fame. You can insert whoever into your head. He It's going to be the Ninja Turtle. Okay. <laughs> he heard the same sound, but he kept going. When he arrived at the 10-foot pit, he looked down at Floyd, and he tried to ignore the pebbles going just crashing around behind him. Um, Miller once said that a minute seems like an hour in a cave, and that's probably what exactly happened in Casey Jones's mind. He later claimed that he was near Floyd Collins for two hours, what he thought were two hours, but it was actually just 15 minutes. Um, what happened next exactly is a little bit hazy, but in attempts to reconstruct it, um, it's believed that Floyd begged Jones to come down. Every self preserve every moral instinct in Casey Jones told him to go down. You know, right. it's a man, it's whether you know this man or not, this man is in a terrible situation. Every moral fiber told him to go down. Every mortal self-preservation instinct told him to turn around. Um, self-preservation went out. And he said, I can't right now, Floyd, but I will when I'll, I'll come down when I come back. He's going to come down with his hockey stick. He's going <laughs> he's gonna to wiggle it in. I can't come down right now, punk. Jones's partner begged him to leave. He's still up there a little bit. You know, he's not totally left his partner. He's just left the danger zone. Um, below, Collins is like, I'm thirsty. Jones took the bait. He slid headfirst into the pit and he ladled coffee. Into I don't know. Coffee isn't thirst quenching, people. That's not something you ladle. That seems no, like a weird thing to ladle. It's not soup. It's coffee. It's not like punch. That'd be great if you brought a big punch bowl. And he's <laughs> One of those ones with the sherbet floating in it? Yeah, exactly. Floyd rejected this coffee and he didn't, it was then that Jones didn't realize that he was thirsty. Floyd was, he was, he was lonely. I mean, he was Aww. departing from this failed Jack attempt. And I mean, it's just, I can't imagine being in there like 112 plus hours. Occasionally people come down, but just down there alone in the dark with yeah. thoughts has got to be some kind of hell. There are only so many times you can sing 99 bottles of beer on the wall. Exactly. And then from above, Jones's um, partner yelled, for God's sakes, Jones, come out, you'll get us killed. He looked into Floyd's eyes, Casey Jones did. He set the coffee down and he pulled himself out of the pit. He wiggled underneath the sagging ceiling and crawled into a space that let him look behind. And he saw that passage close like a vice. Mm. Um, hours earlier, the bulb skeets had wrapped around um, Collins' neck. Had um, been, it, it illuminated. It let people know that there's Floyd. Now they could not see that at all. Only in the darkness, the only thing they could hear were Colin's sobs saying, stay with me. Oh, please don't leave me. Which is awful. Yeah. At hour 118, <laughs> um, they uh, skied the Lieutenant Borden, woke up Wednesday morning. They were like, we can save Floyd today. He, Miller planned to use a torch to burn away rocks. I I don't know if you can use fire to burn rocks. At, at this point, they are just slinging crap on the it, wall. It, whose line it. is it anyways now? It's, yeah. It's yes, anding. Yeah. Um, Have we tried I, eating the rocks? Has anyone tried eating the rocks? We need a pool noodle. I need, I need a name and an occupation. Yeah. <laughs> um, he, after he planned to burn these two rocks away, jacking that one rock that was on his foot would be much easier. They had not heard about the collapse and the breakdown of San Kevin until they got there. Miller, once full of optimism and just a beacon of hope, just positively, he was totally, totally full of despair at this point. 
Fair enough. Um, he went into the sand cave and faced a pile. And when he saw the rocks, his heart just dropped into his chest. He attempted to move some of the stones, but each time he tried to move them, more of them fell. Um, a large chunk of clay crashed onto his feet and he said, um, he came out and he looked at Burden and this is Skeets when he came out of that cave. Burden said, he wouldn't tell me what's the matter, but he did tell me for God's sake, no one go back in there and see that Homer Collins doesn't go in. So Skeets, once this optimistic young man is now just like, and he was so convinced and he wrote, I can save him, I know I can't. It's, it's totally, totally not, he's lost it. So it's like, what's, what's gonna happen now? Um, Homer had a cough, like a really bad cough. He could not go out. The people were like, you're, you're gonna be no use to Floyd. However, they did need to worry about Johnny. Johnny was mad because he had warned people that sending all these people into the cave was gonna cause it to collapse. But um, much of Wednesday was spent over men screaming the best way to handle this cave-in. Um, so under Carmichael's orders in the evening, Gerald, Johnny had assembled a small crew and he delivered this ultimatum to them. There's death down there. The walls and ceilings are crumbling. Unless you are determined to take the biggest chance of your life you've ever taken, tell me now and stay outside. So Johnny would enter and leave the sand cave at least five times over the next eight hours. Um, in the woods, men sawed trees. They chopped logs to shore up the cave walls. Johnny and his crew reinforced the walls um, and cracks. He assessed that about four barrels of rocks would need to be moved. And that's Johnny at the, the site. So he's a little bit younger than that, that chubbier fellow we saw earlier. Um, so, I, and how, how old is, um, is uh, Floyd again? 37. 37, okay. Yeah. I, 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 I was trying to figure out Johnny's age. He'd be about Johnny, he's probably about the same. If they were boyhood friends. Yeah, about yeah, exactly. Age. Yeah. Um, the first time that Johnny descended after that cave-in, he could hear his friend, uh, Floyd could hear him crawling and asked him to bring him a cheese sandwich. Johnny told him that there had been a cave-in and a breakdown and Floyd just sobbed, just lost it. Johnny tried his dangest to move all the fallen rocks. Within hours, there were pillar of lights piercing that pile around Floyd <laughs> and the bulb, because the bulb around Floyd's neck did light up the way. There was room enough for Johnny to squeeze through. He returned to the surface to gather equipment and told the men huddled outside that Floyd be with them in an hour. I'm this is awful. I'm just picturing Floyd just weeping, thinking that his entire life is gone and he just and Johnny has, doesn't know what else to do, so he just starts ladling coffee onto his face. Just like Next time I see helping. him, I'm gonna big old ladle of coffee just for yeah. you. Out. <laughs> just, just picturing just the despair, just like this coffee hitting him in the face, like, oh, yeah. I want coffee. So we're at hour one thirty two. 10.30 p.m. February 4th. He went down January 30th. It is now February 4th. Johnny enters the sand cave for the final time. He went through the walls. He went through the squeeze. He did it all. He lurched forward. He was going to squeeze past that rock pole and give his friend food. Then he was going to use a grease gun full of Vaseline to coat the rocks around Floyd's foot. Why not? But when he got to the cave-in, he noticed that Floyd's light was no longer blinking or a light. The cave-in, it had re-crumbled. Mm. Johnny stared. He laid there on his hands and knees, staring at this rock pile for 15 minutes. Um, he began to yell, Floyd. A rock fell and hit Johnny on the head. Mm. He yelled, Floyd again. 
He heard a moan from the other side. He yelled for Floyd again. Floyd replies, I've done gone home and gone to bed. Johnny was worried that his friend was losing it, slipping out of consciousness. And at this point, if you slip out of consciousness, the likelihood of you coming back is getting very small. Yeah. He, Johnny willed himself to clear this passage. He ignored all the pain and everything, but then suddenly a huge rock fell square on his back. No more than 15 minutes later, he came out of it and he said, I would not go back into that damn place if they deeded me the state of Kentucky. So now his best friend is like, I can't anymore. You know, there's that, I can't. So at hour 142, the state assumes control of the Collins rescue operation. A Lieutenant General Denhart told Homer that it would take men with brains to get his brother out. His first directive was to banish every, nobody enters the sand cave no more. Sand cave off limits, we're gonna dig a shaft. He asked Henry Carmichael, who was part of the asphalt company, to leave the dig. He enlisted his employees and received volunteers from a handful of other organizations, including the Louisville and Nashville Railroad, the Southern Signal Company, the US Mines Rescue Team, engineers from the State Highway Commission, and representatives sent directly from the governor of Kentucky. Most of the local town folk were excluded. They weren't people with brains. This is where the resentment starts to build between the city folk and the town folk. A geology professor visits the site and accesses the best place to dig while locals are like, you picked the wrong spot. You don't dig in that spot. They complained when rocks and trees were felled to move to clear away for a dumping site. The officials waited for equipment to arrive. They complained that digging a shaft would take too long. Homer resented the fact that the chief exponents of the shaft were mostly men who had not been down to see Floyd. You know, it's at this point, it was like, Floyd's our boy. Floyd's our hometown boy, you know? And now you're gonna go down and get him. You're gonna be the person to go down. You don't know Floyd from hole in the ground. Um, Pun intended. Miller. Huh? Pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> Miller Skeets was just despaired. He says, a few hours ago, an undaunted man lived, in faith, in his, lived on his faith and hope. Through the hours of agony, he kept his eyes on an imaginary ray of light, but that light is dark forever. Soon, the fancy, learned, book smart people's tests proved what the locals already knew. The fancy, heavy machinery was useless. The cave inhaled exhaust from the gas-powered engine, so basically, the, all that exhaust was just going down the floor. Yeah. That's not going to do us any good. They realized that they would have to dig this 55 foot shaft with picks and shovels. On Thursday at hour 146, the first ounces of earth were removed. Carmichael had no knowledge of caves, but he placed his faith in his quarrying experience. He estimated that 75 volunteers could dig up two feet per hour. And if they worked around the clock, they would have a lateral tunnel neck into the sand cave within 30 hours. Basically, it was like Floyd was here. They were going to dig a shaft next to him and then go over and across. Okay. To get him. Um, it was a warm Friday. Nothing really worked. They um, underestimated the soil. So the Carmichael, to his credit, he monitored his workers. The minute one of them saw, showed signs of exhaustion, he was like, you're out, new guy that just took a nap, you're in. Um, at 10 feet, it narrowed the shaft. So only two people could get in there at a time. At 15 feet, they hit boulders. So they assembled a pulley system of pulleys and buckets. Mules were called in to haul things away. Railroad tracks were laid to get stuff out of the, into a dump site. Um, they got six inches an hour was how much they could dig. Uh, the 30, our timetable, they had 17 feet in 30 hours when they he thought he would have 55. Mm. Locals just watched helplessly. Lieutenant Burden worried that Floyd was dying of hypothermia. Um, he had earned a permission to get a fire hose and blast uh, warm air into the cave, which made Johnny mad because Johnny said, did I not just tell you 
Heat makes this thing fall in. I know you're worried about him being cold. If we send a huge blast of hot air down into him with a fireman's hose, you're just going to kill him anyway. Yeah. Um, he basically um, accused, Johnny accused Carmichael of murder, basically. Um, he, Johnny was then banned from the rescue site by the lieutenant general. So it's kind of that. I, I heard once that this was kind of a very diehard situation. Yeah. You know, where it's like, we need the FBI. Yeah. When Johnny was banned, locals got mad and they got their varmint guns and seriously considered chasing off <laughs> the troops with their varmint guns, as was the custom at the time. Yes. I'm surprised they didn't just come out with the torches and pitchforks. Yes. At this point, so Johnny went home and when he's walking home, he notices all these unfamiliar license plates and all these cars clogging the roads. And it's getting weird. This is where the ace in the hole part of it comes into it, I think. Um, so an hour, 2.15, poor Floyd, 2.15. Um, sketch artists, photographers, reporters, telegraph operators, radio operators, the media storms Cape, Cape City. Miller's report had appeared in more than 1,200 newspapers across the country. Silent film crews showed up to catch footage. Radio operators posted regular bulletins from the site. This was like the first instance of like on-site media reporting. Um, and then this happened. Because everyone just heard so much about Lloyd Collins that what better thing to do Come on, don't be up for it, please. But what better thing to do than to take the family down to see Floyd Collins in that hole? Um, Five cent hamburgers, I'd go. <laughs> they're, I picture they're like those wimpy hamburgers from Popeye. Yeah. Um, 400 automobiles were in uh, Cape City by Friday, and by Sunday, that number had increased by tenfold. Cave City's population was 690. This got insane. Pastor, insane. Pastors were transformed into parking lots. Banks ran out of money, like physical money. Restaurants ran out of food. Homes were made into hotels. People paid to nap in bathtubs, not spend overnight, just nap in other people's bathtubs. Vendors hopped hamburgers, hot dogs, and knickknacks. People set out their pretty blankets and just sat on the edge and watched what was happening. Um, Pickpockets showed up and stole stuff. People sold their white lightning moonshine. A juggler showed up. <laughs> okay. I, I, I don't know why that's the silliest part, but it is. It's just like some, you know, we all know that one guy that like juggles. Like, as, yeah. especially as, like, a performer, it's like, that's my thing. I juggle. And he yeah. hears, there's a guy trapped in a cave. There's a lot of people there. He, like, grabs his clubs and his balls. And he I, 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 I like to think that he was actually working at the bank in town. <laughs> and then everyone came and was chance. like, now's the time. It's juggle time, baby. You <laughs> all laughed at me when I bought my pins. But now it's juggle day. Floyd, I'm going to juggle you to freedom. <laughs> um. 2,000 people huddled, huddled around the barbed wire fence that had assembled outside. They had basically constructed a barbed wire fence around the work area. 2,000 people pressing in, waiting and watching, and nothing happened. They came to see Floyd pulled out of the earth, either dead or alive, and nothing happened. By 5 p.m., that funhouse atmosphere was gone. People left, um, and... Now, the volunteers that were working it were just trying to keep on working the way they had before all that insanity started. Um, while families from out of town left Cape City, you know, what a great, did you enjoy the trip, sweetie? Yeah, mom, I really enjoyed it. There was a grieving family pacing the muddy woods, waiting for their son or their brother to be taken out of this living nightmare. Um, and now, for some reason, at this point, the author adds that they sold blue balloons with the word sand cape stamped on the side to children because that's what you need 228 hours in it began to drizzle they had to erupt a, a construct a tarp over the area where they were working they had to get generators to pump out the um the mud and the water 
Um, the shaft had hit 25 feet, but it wasn't even halfway to its goal. Four inches per hour. That was all they were able to do. Carmichael had resorted to dynamite earlier that day at that point, but the explosives did not chip at that boulder blocking the way. Um, now the whole, all the people coming to like the carnival atmosphere, it had brought some positive attention. Um, volunteers came, some were engineers and miners, many of them were not. 10 students from the Western Kentucky Normal High School, I don't know what a normal high school is, but it's normal high school. It's not the abnormal high school. No. It's the normal high school. Um, a handful of them football players arrived with a note from, I'm guessing, the superintendent saying they were excused from a week's worth of classes to help with Floyd. And six other students, 600 other students are ready to come if additional aid, aid is needed. And the trusty Brotherhood of Hobos sent aid. Is that a real thing? I believe at the time it was. There was like a Brotherhood of Hobos. Thank God. I <laughs> want that to be real so bad. One of them lifted people's spirits by playing the harmonica. Yes. This See, is my these little kernels. Of this is my favorite thing about the entire story. At first it was the you juggler. You want to hear the Brotherhood of Hobos? No. Story. Yeah. I, I, like I, any uh, First of all, I just love the word hobo. I, and and the fact that there is an organized society of hobos and he's like, well, I'm going to go There's like a whole here. hobo code, a whole hobo language. Oh, yeah. There's like signposts and fence yeah. posts. You make little symbols say this, that, uh, like this place has, gives you hot apple pie. And I like, oh, man, I love the hobo way. <laughs> the Brotherhood of Hobos. It sounds Brother like a very strange, like, super protein. I, I love the fact that it's organized. Yes. There's, a, there's an organized Brotherhood of Hobos. Yes. I, um, I I now need to know more about this. Like I I am very invested in. You, when you get off, you're gonna be like, how to Google. I, I'm going to Google the Brotherhood of Hobos, and I'm going to try to join. I need to join the Brotherhood of Hobos. That would be. I I hope you get that dream, Adam. I I will show up with my bindle, <laughs> and I will say I am ready to join and hop on a box car to um uh, okay. to Mississippi. Nice. I am excited for this. So Good. some of the volunteers believe that Floyd was still alive. A radio had some, an amplifier had somehow been jerry-rigged to the wire that was connected to Floyd's light bulb. And the, this amplifier would crackle about 20 times a minute, which they hoped was a sign of Floyd breathing. 20 times a minute doesn't seem often enough breath for me. Is that great? But it's, it's something, it's noise. It's, it's moving. The progress by now was like woefully stagnant. Boulders tilted from the shaft's clay walls and against the timber shoring. The Carmichael is now worried that the, bold, the rocks might crush his workers and suspend the dig. And he had to stop the dig for eight hours while they were reinforced and secured. Which I can understand. You don't want your, your workers getting crushed. Yeah. You know? um, Tuesday and Monday go by. Monday and Tuesday go by. On February 11th, hour 228, it starts to snow, which makes it harder to work. If you've ever worked outside, I mean, even like just clearing my windshield in the winter without gloves on, it's that their fingers start to go sure. frozen. And the new tests of the radio amplifiers showed that um, Floyd's light had gone out. The shaft was now 44 feet long. This is where, now there's nothing new to report. Skeets isn't reporting really anymore because there's nothing new to report. This is where the great American um, tradition of conspiracy theories comes in. <laughs> oh, it? good. Now we've got Floyd Collins. Floyd's not in the, you know, because Floyd's family was not wealthy and his father was going around asking for donations. This is just a big scam now to get them money. Floyd's not even down there. Look at all this commerce and all this businesses is coming to Cape City. It's from the it's from their government, you know. Even there were even people that went so far as to send telegrams from Kansas as Floyd, saying, "Please contradict statements that I am buried alive in Sand Cave. Tell mother I am all right. Am coming home." Floyd Collins. So even back then, we had these jerks, you know, those yeah. people who, like call in to like tip lines and hey, everything that's awful right now has always been awful. Oh yeah. 
Like that, like that's the thing. Everyone's that's like, oh, can, human you, can you believe that people are doing this? Yes, people have done this for hundreds of years. I believe this. I believe all of this. So now, a lot of these theories were easy to dismiss, but now there are accusations of criminal negligence that are not easy to dismiss. Um, they decide that they have to have, by the governor of Kentucky, they have to have a military court of inquiry in the middle of trying to save this man's life. They call an entire week leading up to Valentine's Day. While Floyd is down there, they have a military brass come in and interrogate Homer, Skeets, Johnny, Robert Byrd, and everybody. It's like, this is the time for a military inquiry into what's going on? Because some people are like, well, Johnny rejected help. And, you know, so he's criminally negligent. No, but, but then Burden did this. But then Carmichael did this. The inquiry showed that Johnny did reject help. But so had Burden. And so had Carmichael. And so had the lieutenant general. None of them were hungry for publicity. They were just, and I like this, no one was hungry for publicity. They were just starved for trust. And this is their, that thing that comes in where we got caving people. We got rescue people. They just don't trust each other. And they can't seem to find that trust. And it's that hard-headedness that is okay well now we've wasted a week because you guys couldn't sit down and work out your issues like like adults I, I'm, like I, I'm getting a sense of life of brian when he's on the cross and they uh, are talking about like, like uh, coming up with an inquiry and a, and a task force to face this, like, he's, this literally, such, he's literally dying on the cross like, like this take, is such basic stuff okay yeah. You admit that you were wrong, and you admit that you were wrong, and now we all say that we're sorry. It's basic, it's stuff that you do as a teacher, you know. It's like, it's like I, well, the same thing happened with Hurricane Katrina when yeah. people were literally waiting to be rescued, and they're like, okay, let's figure out why this happened. It's like, we can figure it out later. Can we get the people yeah, off the roofs? Be, you've got people on the roofs now. Um, so basically, I love what they say here that a cocktail, the resulting tension between the people who were knowledgeable in caving, not knowledgeable in rescue, people who were knowledgeable in rescue, but not knowledgeable in caving, was a cocktail of mistri mistrust, pride, and exhaustion that caused the rescue mission to sputter from the start. Mm. Valentine's Day, hour 360, we have not come full circle. He's still in that hole. Um, the court concludes, hey, no foul play. Um, so now we got 55 feet of dirt and rock had been excavated and Carmichael gives the order to burrow sideways into the sand cave. So now they're going into the, the area. Our 411, that poor man has been underground 17 days, 12 days without food or water, four without the light that gives him heat. The odds were not in Floyd's favor, but the rescuers held out hope. Um, reporters pressed against the barbed wire fence. More than two dozen telegraph operators stood by. Seven airplanes were idling in a pasture, waiting to transport photos, negatives to, um, to newsrooms. It was just, everyone was just waiting, just bated breath to see what would happen. And at 1.30 p.m. on Monday, February 16th, a chisel entered and finally penetrated the sand cave. They tugged at rocks to widen the hole, and finally a rescuer named Ed Brennan shined his lantern into the gloom, and confirmed that they had broken foot, broken through to the sand cave. Um, he gripped a shoring board and eased himself into the cave. The next five minutes were just incredibly tense as he kind of makes his way looking around. He looks his light, he he's aiming his light around looking for Floyd. Crickets move around. So Floyd may have even eaten some crickets, you know, it's a good source of protein. Um, he saw a glimmer. And then he saw what was causing the glimmer. Floyd had a gold tooth. And it was shining in the light, but it wasn't moving. He gets hauled out of the hole, um, Ed Brenner, and says, dead. The coroner would later claim that Collins had died about three days earlier when his light went out. Mm. So, understandably, just as with, I sent you a graphic of a John Edward Jones, who was a caver who got stuck in Nutty Petty Cave in Utah, and they entombed him there. They mm -hmm. poured concrete over it and was like, nobody's going in here again. We can't get him out. They decided that it was better to keep Floyd down there because with the shaft walls buckling, getting the body out was just too dangerous for the living. And Skeet Miller says, it seems that the earth using the corpse's bait is waiting to crush anyone daring to venture into it. 
just I love Skeet's writing is just so that's I, that's really good the earth using the corpse as bait I that's love a, that wonderful that, imagery that definitely paints a picture he does yeah and that's one of the am I screen sharing I should be screen sharing I'm seeing just your general desktop screen Let's stop the share right now and then we're gonna get to screen sharing again so they couldn't get him out sadly which was you know it's hard it's hard for a family so they had a service on top of the site that is a site a picture of the funeral mm -hmm. um a choir sang nearer my god to thee which um floyd used to play hymns on the stalactites no the stalagmites those are the ones that come out of the ground yeah. and, and that was one of the ones he would play and i really like that hymn because that's also the naval hymn and my father is a naval person, so I know that, mm. that him. Um, soon, Cave City was empty. The, this was filled with soil. Um, and Floyd Collins just kind of faded into obscurity. He had monopolized the news for two weeks, but now it just faded. He's like Alien Gonzalez. Yeah, Alien, yep. Yeah. But contrary to popular rumors, this didn't make Floyd's family rich. Um, after the National Guard had packed up and left, people saw Floyd's father scouring the site for glass bottles. I'm assuming it was kind of like the things where you turn in the glass bottles and you get money. Yeah. Now, meanwhile, the owner of the sand cave, because it was on his property, was a man named B. Doyle. He decides to get all, I don't know what, and he puts up a sign on the side of the highway that says, this isn't the exact sign, but it says 200 yards away, the body of Floyd Collins is imprisoned in the sand cave. And so for 50 cents, people could have a visit and look at the gaping hole that had swallowed a man that had once been B. Doyle's friend. Yeah, so, that sounds about right. Yep, gosh, got a love humanity. Yep, that's America. A bunch of the rescuers went home without any compensation, which I mean, I think for me personally, that's not something you do for money. Yeah. I don't think if it's like your job, if you're like in the National Guard, but a lot well, of Oh yeah, they, they're volunteers by yeah. nature. They don't get paid. A lot of them lucked into the, the vaudeville contracts and yeah. they toured theaters across the country, tantalizing audiences with their heroic first person accounts. Skeets um, was offered a $50,000 lecture circuit contract, which he turned down. Mm. Instead, he returned to his job at the Louisville Courier Journal. And the next year, his coverage of this story would earn him the Pulitzer Prize in reporting. So yay, Skeets. Good for him. Now, Homer went on the vaudeville circuit for eight months, but it was not for personal gain. He would tell people stories of him and his brother's childhood. Um, he was doing this because he wanted to get Floyd out. He says, um, I kept thinking of Floyd lying in the muck where he had suffered beyond our power to imagine. I would never have peace of mind if he remained there. So he toured the lecture, he did vaudeville for eight months and he toured and earned money. And then seven months in April after, um, that's not seven months, Ashley, you know how to do math. Um, four months later, and this, is, this is a history lecture, it's not a math lecture, okay. <laughs> I'm good at history, I'm not good at math. Um, he and seven miners went in from the opposite side of the cave where the rock was and they redug the shaft and they removed the rock first that was pinning Floyd's leg. That rock weighed 27 pounds. Oof. And a little bit of a content warning, not too much, but this is, they got him, they got him out. That is just the people that they got these. And I'm assuming that this isn't necessarily the miners that pulled him out, but these are the family, the friends, it's probably Johnny and Homer yeah. and all of them. Um, on April 26, 1925, Floyd was lowered into a grave on the family cemetery plot and a stalagmite marked his plot. That's not I, the end of this story. <laughs> I, I will say I'm glad they got him out because I could, I, it would suck to die in a cave and be like, we're just going to leave you in that cave. If you like, ever, if you ever get an, if you ever can deal with it, John, 
Edward Jones and Nutty Putty Cave is awful. It's, I, I told you that that's a man who he was like 26 and he was, he had a pregnant wife and a one-year-old daughter and he was just, they couldn't get him out. So they just entombed him in there. He's what, 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 what was, was this after Floyd? This was in 2009. Oh. Yeah. So that's, I mean, even now, I mean, there are just some parts of the earth that we can't get to yeah we're not meant to go <laughs> probably, probably best we don't yep so in so floyd was put into the family cemetery in 1925 april 26 now in 1927 lee collins floyd's dad sold crystal cave to a dentist named harry b thomas tourism in the area had plummeted after collins had died it almost had been, instead of like a boom like yeah everyone let's go caving it was kind of like no one go caving. It kind yeah, of no like the first atmosphere to it. Um, now, but the but a lot of people, some people, um, did start to go caving um, because they wanted to be. They wanted to discover the next big cave. They discovered the cave. Floyd Collins could have discovered Just a few. Not a lot of like it, these were more like locals than tourists or like cavers from other areas. But the federal government noticed. And shortly after Collins died, Congress authorized a prior motion to convert Mammoth Cave into Mammoth Cave National Park. Basically, this controls who can go down there. No one can, not, you can't just walk into Mammoth Cave National Park and be like, I'm going cave. And it's like, this is a national park. You can't just do that. So in a tragic turn, Floyd's death really helped get Mammoth Cave to the national park status. Now, mm. Lee would sell his stake in Crystal Cave before Washington uh, purchased the land. And in Henry, and this is a little bit, a little bit of a content warning. And in this deal, he sold it to Dr. Thomas. He sold to Dr. Thomas Crystal Cave. And in, there was one very, very morbid clause. Dr. Thomas could exhume Floyd's body and display it in Crystal Cave, which is awful. Okay. He got, Floyd's father got $10,000 for this. The rest of the family was appalled. Yeah, fair enough. Now, but the gimmick worked. This is a postcard you could have gotten from Crystal Cave. And if you look carefully here, this is Crystal Cave. And right here, that's Floyd's casket, and that's Floyd's headstone. The rest of the family was appalled. Um, it was embalmed, and it, the, the um, headstone proclaimed him the greatest caver ever known. Um, but in 1929, grave robbers stole Floyd's corpse and attempted to chuck it into the Kentucky Green River. But the body got tangled in a bush. So. They bailed. Dr. Pomp Thomas got the body back, but Floyd's left leg was missing and has never been found. That is the leg that was pinned under the rock. Right. Somewhere out there, whether in the wilderness of Kentucky or in someone's attic, is Floyd's Collins leg. Now. It's, it, I think it's someone's umbrella stand. Oh, that would be, but could you imagine? I don't understand why people rob graves to begin with, especially famous people, because then it's not like, you can't just like show them off. Yeah. Like, you can't steal a famous painting and then be like, look at the famous painting. I, I understand robbing a grave to get jewelry or things yeah, or like gold that. Or, yeah, or if you're going to sell the corpse to like, uh, to medical students. Yes, Birkenham. That, yeah, like that makes sense. I, I, I'm not saying I approve of this, no. uh, of this weekend justify. activity, but I can justify it. Just stealing it to have a corpse like I, they they almost sound like like vigilante corpse like grave robbers because they're like he he shouldn't be in this cave and then they try to chuck him in a river. Your and leg like, oh, is he's, free now, he's, Floyd. He's stuck and they're and they're trying to like poke him with a broom while like his corpse is tangled in a bush. He's and and then someone shines a flashlight and they just bail. Mm -hmm. And and the only thing that they could get was the foot. It was the whole leg. It's from the hip to the foot. That whole leg is gone. So Dr. Thomas, once he got that body back from being tangled in the bush, he put a chain around the coffin. <laughs> I guess that solved the problem. In you want zombies? Because that's how you get zombies. That's how we get zombies. We get you put, chain, 
I, I that you've now chained a zombie to your cave. Congratulate <laughs> a legless zombie. Well, Congratulations. one guy's hopping. He's hopping. Yeah. Um, 32 years later, in 1961, the U.S. government purchased Crystal Cave with Collins still inside. Eventually, they closed that cave to the public. I'm not quite sure why, but you can't go in Crystal Cave anymore. Um, the only time they've gone in is for trapped. The U.S. government did let um, people in, and they found, like, the. it was really neat. They And that book has a lot of great pictures, and they find, like, the bottles and the old like liquor bottles and stuff just like mm. from Floyd's time. Yeah. Um, so cave and Sand Cave, they also opened up Sand Cave to them. Um, and in 1989, our boy Floyd got taken out of Crystal Cave and he was buried at the Mammoth Cave Baptist Cemetery where you can still visit him today. And his epitaph does include the greatest cave explorer ever known. That's fair. Yep. I, I, I can't tell you a second one aside from, aside from Johnny. Yep. It, and it's, um, the interesting thing is this was, he didn't get a final resting place until 64 years after his death. When this book first came out, this is the 1999 revised edition. When this book first came out, he was still in that cave. Um, so it's kind of just a little bit terrifying. But yeah. the interesting thing is that they eventually, um, Crystal Cave eventually was deemed to be worth the amazing life-changing amount of money that Floyd hoped it would have been. The National Park bought Crystal Cave at the time in, I believe, 61 for 2,000, I'm sorry, 285, I can't read numbers. $285,000 at the time. Now that'd be like 2 million. Mm -hmm. um, later and professional cavers also confirmed Collins hunch that all the caves in the region were connected. It is 405 miles of passageway, making it the largest caving system in the world. So Floyd was right. However, sand cave has never been connected to that system. Um, it's never been connected to the rest of the Mammoth Cave system. And people don't think that it ever will be. No one has just, there's that kind of that aura, kind of that ghost of Floyd a little bit. Yeah. It's quite, even with all the modern caving equipment we have, and Floyd's just doing this with a can of, you know, a kerosene lamp and a rope, you know. It's and like. I, I, honestly, it's like people that want to sail on the new Titanic. Like, why would you do that? Yes. You're just tempting fate. Um, and it's interesting that if you do go in the, if you go Mammoth, in Mammoth Cave, you will occasionally find FC scratched into the walls, which is kind of interesting and cool. Um, and it ends, this article ends with, we probably will, never will find if Sand Cave is connected. Geologically, it's likely that it's connected to the rest of the Mammoth Cave system. But the truth is, after what happened here in 1925, nobody is determined to search for the missing link. Once upon a time, there lived a man fearless and talented enough to find it. And sadly, that man is gone. So it's, it's very, I know this was a long one, but it's an interesting story just how people just, it was the first big media circus. I mean, this was yeah. the third biggest story after the Lindbergh flight and the kidnapping. So that's just crazy and just how people couldn't, put their differences aside and trust and come together. I, I remember when I saw Ace in the Hole, it's been many years since I've seen that, but I, I remember the scene with him stuck, uh, when it, with him stuck in the cave and them having the whole like fair above him. And there's like yeah. a big Ferris wheel and everything. And meanwhile, just like, like and, and then it just cuts to, you know, the guy in the cave alone talking yeah. to the reporter, you know? Yeah, and you and, never, and, and you, when you think that like Floyd never knew probably yeah. what was going on above him. What, and, and and what's funny is that, you know, I, when I saw the movie, I didn't realize that it was so, it's so lined up with, with real life. I yeah. thought like, I, like, like I thought they were just taking the term media circus literally and just for the movie, I didn't realize that they had a whole festival there going. Oh yeah, it was, and in the musical as well, there's a whole number called Isn't It Remarkable, which is three guys singing in, uh, three reporters who aren't skeet singing in very close harmony, just talking about all these great things that are going on. And they're sending their things back to their news office and they're getting the story wrong and they're misquoting people. And there's 
like it's just it's kind of insane when you think about you know how much is not much has changed in almost a hundred years it's a it's a, it's a weird thing to write a musical about i gotta say it's very it's very it's weird but it's yeah. very interesting i'll tell you how it ends what it ends is that with this beautiful song floyd sings all by himself where he's um he has this hallucination with it's called out my foot <laughs> he has this hallucination first with hey where'd my leg go <laughs> and he has a sister one of his sisters was named nelly oddly enough nelly in real life met her first husband at the dick site <laughs> for her brother they have this um this song where they're imagining all the great things that they're doing and they're going to get floyd cleaned up to get his picture taken by the press and then he realizes that it's a hallucination that it's mm. not real and his sister tells him you know you you have to let go it's okay to let go and he sings this great song called how glory goes and you don't know what glory is you don't know when glory will come to you and that sort of a thing and what is the afterlife like and that sort of thing and the way it ends and it's so some productions do this with multiple singers and some mm -hmm. people do it with sound effects Floyd has this call, that, and it's called The Call. It just goes like, die, 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 die. And you hear him after he sings this beautiful song. He, sing, he makes that call, and you just hear echo, echo, echo. And each time it's echoing, it's fading away until mm. it's just deathly silent. So it's, it's really, it's just, it was one of the, I like. It I, sounds funny. <laughs> funny. <laughs> it's a, I, it's a, it, it sounds like a real chuckle fest. It's, it's beautiful. The music is extremely complex as well, which isn't something, and it only had 25 performances off Broadway, but like, um, Cass Morgan was in it. Um, if you're familiar with Brian Darcy James, who played Shrek in Shrek the Musical, he was in something raw and he's one of the reporters. And it's, I want someone to do Floyd Collins because I have so many ideas how to direct it, you know, how to mm -hmm. stage it and that sort of thing. And, you know, I'm a costumer, like I want to get those people covered in mud as the show goes on and all the greasy and stuff like that. But it's an, it's a really interesting show that I think can be done well. You just have to be careful with it. So yeah. I love, I also love stories that are based on history. I mean, you know, I also want to do the musical Thrill Me, which is based on the Leopold and Loeb murders. Yeah. I'm a weirdo. But on that note, I will leave you to go Google the Brotherhood of Hobos. The Brotherhood of Hobos. I will join. I will get a card that will say <laughs> official member of the Brotherhood of Hobos. Yep. And we will, we will live by the hobo code. Yes. And we'll, next time we'll see you, you'll have your little bin. Yes. Right, yes. Well. I, I will eat nothing but pies that have been left on windowsills. <laughs> you'll have to float it's, to them. <laughs> yeah. You have to, it, you have to master floating. It's going to be a good life. 2020 turnaround for me. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for the history lesson. Bye.